what is machine learning? Uh, let's quickly talk about the introduction of machine learning. So machine learning is a method of teaching computers, computers to be able to predict data based on data. And that's as simple as that can get. So we are teaching the machine to be able to do things which they, which we, it's not about programming, which you are really talking about a specific code and X, Y, Z, and the third step is accordingly going to happen. It's not about that. And after the machine learning technique has been applied and it's been successful, the machine may be able to do, will be able to do uh, things which you didn't even teach them, uh, surrounding things. So that's the beauty of uh, machine learning techniques. Real life example, as we were talking before the session, uh, some people like, what is machine learning doing and has it changed or IoT has brought in? No, it has been there for a while, quite some time in the industry. It is just catching up. The industry is getting a lot of buzz around it and we'll see some of the graphs and charts why that is happening uh, as well. Here is a quick example of machine learning. We have been dealing with this for till the time we got email, right? The day we got an email account, we get started getting spams from all kinds of people. Uh, but what has happened, if over a period of time, if you see your machines and your uh, spam, percentage of spams which you are getting is reduced drastically over the years. Why? That's purely machine learning techniques. What companies like Google and everybody for that matter has defined algorithms which not only identify based on language, based on uh, who is sending, which region, and several other parameters, uh, all those parameters, and the machine is, and the servers are able to immediately themselves understand and learn and say, because of this is a spam and it's not because of spam. If you go to your spam folder and check all kind of crazy things, you'll see, wow, why am I getting all these kind of things? But people do get bombarded with all kind of crazy things. And machine learning is trying to help us really get eliminated of that. So that's the first quick example. The other example, which I would say, people may have seen a toy, like a car, a toy car. I mean, as many people may have seen in their life somewhere where they would have uh, hit a wall, it changes the direction, right? Uh, and then it goes further, it hits a wall again, it changes the direction again, and it keeps doing that. And after some time, it is able to walk around that room or the peripheral without hitting anything. What it has done, it has taught itself or itself what are the periphery and the boundary of this area. And nobody really defined that. And if you may have used or seen Roomba, the uh, automatic, uh, uh, the vacuum cleaner, that's what the technique it is using. So some quite variety of examples which are present for us to really see all the power of machine learning. In terms of techniques, uh, machine learning can be thought a um, hybrid of two things. We have statistics, which is going to give us probability and the science of it. And the other aspect is defining data and machine learning data on top of how we can mine huge and huge amount of data because that's what you need to really be able to predict the future and other things around it. So it's a combination of statistics and data mining. Those are the two things combined together. And this is where the part it gets tricky. And there are hundreds and hundreds of techniques uh, which are present and which one to use and when to use. There's quite a lot of uh, understanding which has to happen. So trying to simplify what I have done while we're talking about three main techniques. And the good news is that's all. That's all you need. All the other techniques are just underlying subcategories or specialization of those techniques. Uh, so if you know these three techniques, you know quite a lot in the machine learning world. In fact, you know everything, but only uh, the, the master techniques, if you say, or the major techniques, you would say, and there are several, several subcategories under it. So the one is called as classification. We'll talk of them in a little bit. Classification is a technique of really identifying things and just defining whether it belongs to this bucket or that bucket. Let's say bucket A or bucket B, uh, or maybe several other buckets to be as well, bucket C and all these things. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the other next technique is called as clustering, where you're clustering the data. This is very often used nowadays or this moment, like when elections are going on, uh, when you take tweets from the red and the blue and the Republican and Democrat and try to identify in such a manner and define what's more activity or what's the trending. There are people who have predicted elections. It happened in Obama's uh, election la last time. It happens in many sports events. People predict what's going to happen in that event based on such kind of techniques and defining what's the kind of activity and is it a positive sentiment versus negative sentiment, all that can be defined using these kind of techniques. 
So that's the clustering technique. And the third technique, which we only need, these three techniques, and we'll talk about each of them a little bit more, is called as regression. Regression is a way of defining, identifying how are we really going to be, a pattern is defined, and based on that pattern, as a linear line or a nonlinear line for that matter, is defined and based on that, uh, we are identifying what's going to be the next set of data which we're going to get, how, what's going to be the attributes and values for that. So the C technique. So what I want you to remember is CCR. That's it. So the red three letters, which are acronyms, I would say CCR. Just remember that thing. Keep life simple. You can only remember two, three things. So let's remember three things. And let's go deeper about those and understand few of the techniques. Which I said is classification. So one of the models to understand classification is decision tree model, where it defines, like it takes a three kind of approach, an algorithmic approach, if you would say. It keeps on making decisions at every point. Let's say here is an example we want to find whether this vehicle is a high mileage or a low mileage vehicle. And there are simple questions which are put, uh, where a weight is heavy, and if it is defined yes and no, you go to this category uh, versus the other. There are other questions the horsepower is asked. And based on that, you define anything. This is very, very basic one, but you get the point, uh, which defines how you can go into these categories and define classification. So that's our first technique. Uh, and we'll try to bring them together in the end, um, but try to just understand each of these pieces as isolated for now. So that's classification. Um, clustering. Clustering is a technique where you define into categories. We just go group into those different categories. And it could be based on some attributes, uh, which we know, and we will, without even knowing much of the information which we already have from those pieces of information. For example, here is an example taken from biology, uh, animals versus plants. The only two attributes taken out here are things which are brown and run away from us is animals, and things which are green and don't run away from us is plants. So that's a very basic and simple categorization of things. If you think about it, it may be very confusing to think classification and clustering are very similar. Actually, they are not. They are way apart from each other. Uh, they are very different techniques. And you may be thinking that we are bucketing. We are not. This is more of a bucketing. We are just bucketing into two different categories. And that's happening in clustering. Uh, classification could be in many different ways you can divide, and you could may not be having two buckets. So that's the second technique which you have. The third technique which we talked about is the regression. Uh, in fact, we have used this, uh, especially parents uh, have seen this kind of technique quite often before also. So this is a chart which I think if you have kids, you must have seen your medical uh, doctor showing these kind of techniques uh, and showing like at this person's age, your kids height and weight is so and so. And based on that, when you really go to a certain age, they're predicting what is going to happen to his particular height or weight predictions, right? Um, many people may have seen this, right? Uh, in their lives, uh, in the kids' lives. So that's really regression. What you define is a crime kind of a line, a linear, or it doesn't have to be a straight line. It has, can be um, a curved line, as it is in this case. And it could be multiple of them. And what you're defining is those data points, those kids, uh, which are going to be defined. And you don't know whether the kid is going to be a tall kid or not. And you can start predicting based on this, what's happening based on some data point and collection of huge amount of data which has helped them to define this line. It's not pretty easy to really say this is the prediction of a line, which is lots and lots of data which goes behind things. So that's what regression is doing. Regression is primarily trying to define a line based on all our data points and really help us to really predict about the next set of data sets which we get. These are three techniques. I know these are very isolated topics and areas to understand. But if you think any book or any video you should see about machine learning, you would end up being this thing. There could be more mumbo jumbo around it, but at a high level, if you understand these three techniques, you've got the gist of it and what they are doing. Now, the tricky part, does it make machine learning very easy? Uh, definitely not. What really happens is the tricky part to understand these variables that we define. What is, how we did we define the 86 number? How did we define what is heavy? and all these criteria and what technique to use at what particular time, that's the art. That's the art almost if somebody has to really learn and pick up these things. So these are the foundational blocks. I know quite a lot, 
Uh, but let's try to sum it together. And to sum it together, here is what we try to do, even a one level higher than what we talked about. We're going to talk about, in machine learning, there is two ways of doing machine learning. One is called as supervised machine learning, and there is unsupervised learning. There are two things. And let's take a quick example uh, to understand that, what they, how they differentiate. Let's say we have fruits, apple, banana, cherry, grapes, and different kind of fruits. We all have seen those fruits, ate those fruits in our life, right? So we understand what an apple is. So that's a very easy thing to, for us to identify. So if I bring a kid out here and tell them, like, classify all these different things into different parts, he will be easily able to do it. And now that he's able to provide me, like, this red color thing, which is a medium size, is an apple. And now if some new kind of fruit has been brought, which falls in, we can generate anything. Uh, around that data. If we just get pictures of apples and different kind of fruits like that, and we are just given new pictures, and we are told to identify whether these are apples or gra grapes or bananas, we can do that. Once we have that initial data, which has been identified for us, and that is called as trained data in the machine learning world. We're training the model using this initial data. That's the main difference between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So let's go to unsupervised learning. Let's say we have the same four fruits, but in this case, what's happening, uh, let's say an alien has come landed on the earth, and he doesn't know anything about apple, bananas, and anything. He has never seen these kind of food, fruits, and we have asked them to classify that or just group these things by identify whether it is an apple, a banana, or a grape, right? But what they could, if they have understanding, if they're not colorblind, uh, which we don't know, uh, if they are not colorblind, they will be able to identify some categorization into this, or which we call as clustering. They will be able to identify red fruits, okay? So the cherries and the apple fall in that category, a red group, they will be able to identify. They might be able to identify a green color fruit group, right? Without even knowing what these things are. This kind of class you never got, or technique where you never got a trained data. You don't have that information is called as unsupervised learning. And based on this, they can identify red color group, a green color group, they could even do further. The red with a big size, red with a small size, cherry, all that can be defined. And believe me, these kind of information just by clustering this could be very, very useful as well in the machine learning. It may feel quite vague to see have these kind of groupings and what value we are going to derive out of it, but it could be really, really valuable. Um, there was a research which was done on X-rays, X-rays collected from different different kind of animals, and based on the grouping and the patterns, uh, we can identify back like which kind of animal this is or what kind of uh, X-ray is being used because of this kind of clustering back and continuously. Because everything has a pattern, and you don't even know that animal in the beginning. You don't have the trained data, but because of the pattern, you can really come up and start grouping, and then you say, oh, finally, all this is monkey, or this is that kind of category which can be defined. So that's at a high level, which are the two categories, and all the other categories I just said, the three. For that matter, uh, supervised learning has classification and regression. We talked about the CCR. So classification and regression belongs to the category of supervised learning. And the unsupervised learning is clustering, where you do not have actual information about the trained data. You do not know the pattern or trained data. So that's what clustering is, uh, belongs to this category. So those are the two high level. Um, and that's the crust of it. There are three main techniques, and there are two different ways we divide that learning, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. I tried to come up with a very, very simple model, for example, to be able to explain this. There is, obviously, there is more details and underlying techniques and aspects of it. What happens in a real world? What happens in a real world is any kind of implementation which you do will not just use one technique. Rarely, rarely there will be a situation they'll be using one technique. It will be a combination of the techniques. Mostly what would happen, you will start with the supervised learning, and then you will have an unsupervised learning on top of it, and they could be helping each other and build. And there could be situations that are tens and twenties of techniques being used to solve one single problem. So that's where it gets started to getting complicated. Um, otherwise, these things, at least at this level, I want to keep it very simple. Uh, um, we still a fire hose. Uh, but I think hopefully that is something which I can pass back as three different techniques, top techniques, and supervised and unsupervised learning. 
So what's happening in the industry? In the industry, suddenly from the last year, last quarter, 2015, October, uh, or a little bit around that, there is almost like a war going on machine learning area with different vendors coming in left and right. They were almost like weeks apart, different vendors are coming. Amazon, which came out with their machine learning, almost similar time, almost most of them have been in the last six months period of time or a year max, uh, their offering has come out. So there is a, a machine learning technique which Amazon provides on their cloud offering uh, in the AWS realm of the world. Uh, that's an area which was much earlier defined Google came with the uh, TensorFlow, which is a mechanism without much coding. Uh, you can really apply without much knowledge of what we are going to really do, the underlying techniques, how do you write it, code it, put all the statistics. That's the promise every all of these vendors are really going for. And Google came up with TensorFlow. It has picked up quite uh, market share as well. And then came in pretty late in the market and industry, for that matter, in the cloud area as well, came Microsoft with Azure. Uh, and Azure so started an offering with machine learning, and that's the main focus for today's topic. Um, it has really started picking up machine learning on the Azure side of it, because it's almost, I can feel, uh, it can be debated a little bit with Amazon and some other uh, offerings, but my feeling is like this is by far the easiest to implement without much of technical depth and understanding, and that's why it's getting a lot of traction in the industry right now. It came pretty late, but it's picked up pretty well. I have another one in the whole uh, Spark spectrum, in the big data world, in the open source world, without any vendor, like Spark is the technology in the processing side of the big data. I'm sure most of the people have heard about it. So Spark has its own library called as Spark MLib, which is another offering which is available. <laughs> this is pretty much the big list. Uh, there are other techniques, obviously. There are Mahout, and there are several other com companies and different players which are doing it. I think these are uh, the predominant big players in the industry which is happening uh, right now. This interesting graph, this was just released last month by Gartner. I don't know if it's easy enough to even see. I, I don't expect you to see each of the lines. What I want for you to see the, uh, the light blue circle in the very top machine learning right there. And this was published right there in July 2016 by Gartner. Gartner is a, uh, pretty much the authority in defining a lot of uh, the market research, understanding on different, not only data warehousing and uh, PI in this area, but this overall industry research. And you may have heard about it. What that graph means, what does really this graph, and there is a whole explanation to this graph. This graph is nothing new. Uh, Gartner comes up with similar graph every year. And think go back and forth around this, and there's a meaning for each of this particular section, what this means. So I won't go into all of that detail, but if you see that in the below, there is an innovation trigger, all those aspects which is peak of the inflated expectation. Uh, it's a whole emotional ride altogether, and especially a startup, you can think about, get started. I mean, I can take an example of a quick startup and explain you what would happen typically in this whole cycle. The innovation trigger is almost a startup, like just in the garage starting, and there is nobody knows what's really this area and what's industry is very rarely understood. 4D printing, for example, you see that in that area. We are not even comfortable with 3D printing right now. We're talking about 4D printing. So those kind of things belong there. Things start to really pick up and come to the mainstream, and when it hits that kind of a peak, the hype, that's literally the name of the graph, the hype circle for the emerging technologies, and there are hype circles, charts for articles for everything. When it reaches that point, that's the point like almost everybody's hearing about it. Everybody is getting involved into this. And that's where machine learning right now is. And that's why you may be hearing, everybody's hearing a lot of machine learning. Is it a good thing, a bad thing? It's not a bad thing. Uh, actually, it's a right thing and it's a maturity curve. So why is even, even this happening? Why is it machine learning right on the top and why are we hearing of all of that but in the very recent months or years? I think this is what has happened like last 10 years, big data and Hadoop has been being there. People think like Hadoop has just happened last year. No, it's not. Uh, it was uh, even named in 2006. So that's 10 years anniversary we are celebrating for Hadoop uh, this year. And companies and organizations have really got big data now. Every single organization has almost got in some form or shape, either a pre-OC, a real implementation. Most of them have in production right now. So bigger sizes, smaller sizes, or at least they are thinking they are doing something. So they did that. 
for years, last few years has been that about big data and how big people have been collecting data. And they have collected the data. They have started doing some basic pro uh, processing on that. And now comes the big question, the ROI on it. And to get a real ROI on such huge amount of data to be able to process, everybody's hoping and even betting on machine learning to be the magic sauce uh, which can really do that. Uh, and that's the promise. They want to really use that data which has been. So it's a natural curve. It's a maturity curve, I would say. That's a very good thing which is happening. In, it's a next level of big data conversion or maturity in this whole platform which we are seeing. So right now we are seeing the peak of it, which means it takes two to five years for this to become mainstream, like being used left and right everywhere, all these applications. That's, that's what means when you're on the peak uh, right there. It says in the bottom over there, the two to five years. So that's where it is. All those yellow color ones, um, light blue color ones, have the two to five years. So machine learning is getting buzz. It's not getting over after that. This I don't mislead by this graph. It doesn't mean like it's going to go away or thing. Actually, when it comes to the plateau of productivity, that's the best period to be. Uh, it has survived. It has seen the chaos and the evolution, and then it's being at this point. So it's all good cycle from there. It's not a bad cycle. So don't misunderstand this graph from that matter. It's a very interesting graph. If you have chance, you can refer that. We might even, I might even send that link uh, after the session. I think it's maybe a good read if people are interested, sure. Uh, so that, uh, briefly, I wanted to talk about introduction. It's a brief introduction which we wanted to talk about. Here is an example. It's uh, one of our clients which we are doing right now, trying to implement this machine learning in the big data project to do something very basic. And this basic is needed by every single company. Uh, and the company is already trying to patent that and do that. That's why I can't go more into specifics of how and detailing. Uh, but its basic bottom line is to define a happy customer and an engaged customer or unhappy customer versus happy customer. So that's kind of the definition. There is a lot of math and science which goes behind it uh, to really make that happen. Uh, but this is an example. And, and you can start thinking about we're just putting into two buckets, right? So the bottom line technique which you're going to do is clustering. This is going to come back to clustering. But there are many things which are going to happen uh, to make this finally happen. And there's tons of things which we can do out of it. Uh, it is one of the top projects in that company and the product company. Uh, we can do a lot of things because once you have identified a customer is unhappy and why is unhappy, you can start taking action. And these companies and many companies have uh, customer. You want repeat customer, right? We want subscription to be renewed. And how do we do that if an unhappy customer is not going to renew? And if you come to know about that in the last day of the renewal, like, okay, I'm not renewing. That's too late in the game. The customer is gone. He's already signed up for somewhere else. So knowing that much in advance in the cycle, which we start doing six months before the subscription comes in for renewal a year, and that's what we start getting numbers, not only numbers, green light, yellow light, traffic signal saying, oh, this customer is good. We think that he'll renew. This is yellow. It's uh, happening and, or red. Uh, and why this is happening and what we can do or the T company can do to really convert them from red to green. The interesting part is even the engaged customer is not the whole, doesn't get over. It's not about just he's happy and green, that's done. What also happens, a green customer can be a big, big value. In fact, that's more value. People spend a lot of the time in the unhappy customer. Uh, the big value is here because a happy customer for you can be an ambassador for you. He could refer 10 more people. Uh, he could be cross sales, which means like you can sell him different other products and do different things uh, with him. So that's where your focus should be. But I just uh, wanted to bring that example, a very simple example. Hopefully everybody can relate. Everybody thinks about customers, has dealt with something or the other around it, and how these two get techniques. And this uh, machine learning could help us really get that model as well as then we can think about all the different applications around that. <clears throat> 